something unique about the dry tortugas here is dry tortugas are 70 plus miles away from any of the humans. So there's really very little human impact out on the dry tortugas and as a result of that, the coral reefs are as close to a pristine environment as we get to see today. My name is Graham Kologi, Nate Formel, Patrick Keel, Anderson Mayfield. My name is Nikki Bessmer and I'm a coral researcher at NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory based in Miami, Florida. We are here in Dry Tortugas National Park completing work as part of the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program. I'm the chief scientist on this expedition completing our climate impact monitoring. So we are here looking at how climate impacts are affecting the local coral reefs. So I have four additional team members here with me. We have Graham Kologi and Anderson Mayfield. They're working on the benthic portion of our pericarbonate budget surveys. We also have Patrick Keel has been working on the bioeroder observations for the surveys. And then we have Nathan Formel who has been assisting with our submerged automated sampler maintenance as well as collecting landscape photo mosaics. We monitor our U.S. coral reefs here by a couple different ways. So we have subsurface temperature recorders that we install, different uh, depth gradients to see what temperatures the reefs are experiencing in real time. So this is a subsurface temperature recorder or STR that we just collected from our five meter site. This has been down on the seafloor for three years, so obviously it's had some uh, calcifiers and crust on it. So to do this, we tape it all up makes the cleaning process a little easier. So now I'll be able to pull all the rest of this off and then it's ready to go to download all the data that it's been collecting for the past three years. We also have bioerosion monitoring units and calcification accretion units to see the level of growth that the reef is accumulating and then also the different types of bioeroders that is eroding away at the reef. The last sort of culmination of our research here is focused around our one specific Class 2 Plus site, which is our Bird Key Reef. So at our Class 2 Plus site, we do our pericarbonate budget surveys. This includes an account of the method cover, as well as the different organisms that contribute to bioerosion on the reef. I'm helping out with the benthic survey. So Graham and I are basically laying down transect line. We're looking to see what corals are under there, what types of algae, basically what's occupying the substrate. What we're also doing, we're taking a parameter that's not as commonly analyzed on these types of trips, which is known as rugosity. There's a lot of structure, and this is why they have so much biodiversity. This is why coral reefs have so many different types of fish and vertebrates living there because there's all these places to hide, there's all this structure. So to quantify that, we basically lay a chain down and we see essentially how much this chain oscillates up and down over the surface and we quantify it to give kind of a metric of the structure of the reef. We also take landscape mosaics to be able to get a long-term metric of the coral cover at these sites and we also have instruments deployed First we have our CFET. This is going to collect measurements of pH on the reef. We then have our EGOPAR, which will collect measurements of light. Last we have our tilt meter, which will collect measurements of current. These instruments measure at intervals of every five minutes to help us give a good picture of what the reef is actually experiencing. Last we have our SAS, which is a submerged automated sampler. These are going to collect samples of water at every three hours that we will be able to take back to the lab and collect information, all the carbonate chemistry parameters. The ocean acidification is a process by which the ocean's pH lowers or becomes more acidic through increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere dissolving into the water. This is problematic obviously because many organisms in the ocean, especially the reefs, like corals, produce a calcium carbonate skeleton which is very susceptible to dissolution. As the oceans become more acidic, it becomes harder and harder for these organisms to calcify or lay down new skeleton and thereby build the reef framework with which the reefs are able to persist and, and survive. Primarily we measure that through taking uh, and analyzing water samples. We do that by re deploying remote what are called subsurface automated samplers that we actually developed in-house. At NOAA's AOML lab, we actually created an automated sampler. On this trip we deployed four of these. Every single sampler had two samplers on it and we were able to collect 24 hours worth of water samples from just those four samplers and we only had to go to the site once to drop it off and then the next day once to pick up those water samplers and refill the bags for extra samples. So 
if you look, there are no specialized glass bottles. What we sample into is actually a, a Tedlar bag. It's gas impermeable, which means that the carbonate sample that we take, it won't change over time. All the chemistry stays the same in the bag until we're able to take it out. We actually inject a fixative into it to make sure that any biological processes inside the bag are halted so that that snapshot of water chemistry that we're looking for is identical from the moment it was taken to the moment we're able to collect it and analyze it in the lab. So far, this has been a really great tool to have, and we actually got to start testing it on our first NGRI mission to Dry Tortugas in 2018, where we put out a bunch of these for the same kind of sampling. We've edited the code a little bit and improved it, but now we're using them in almost all of our water sampling efforts at NOAA. It's really exciting to have this tool along for the ride. So we just completed the last live of our trip and we had an extremely successful mission. We were able to locate and swap out all four of our SCR temperature recorders. We were able to complete all six of our benthic surveys for our carbon and budget work. We are going home with 24 samples of water to analyze for carbonate chemistry that will pair well with our instruments we deployed. And we successfully took six of our landscape mosaics. So we're really excited to get back to the lab and see what the last three years of data has shown us. Since the 2018 expedition, thankfully everything I could see visually seemed to be about the same, but of course the data are really what will tell the difference uh, to see if there have been any changes. But visually just seeing that there really wasn't any anecdotal change is actually a good thing because it means that at least the reefs aren't actively dying to the, to the naked eye. We're trying to come up with ways that will make coral restoration more successful. There's a lot of different opportunities to do that. One of them we think is called stress hardening, where you actually expose a coral to intermittent stress. Not so much to kill them, but something to toughen them up so that they're better able to survive in their changing environment. Another way we're looking to do that is to identify which coral are the strongest so that we can foster their growth and their outplanting so that the coral that are out there in nature are the strongest, most resilient coral possible. There's a lot of doom and gloom surrounding coral conservation, and yet, whenever you see coral in a place like Dry Tortugas, where in the absence of human impact, are thriving better than you'd expect, it gives you hope that if we can change what we're doing, we'll be able to make sure that coral reefs don't have anywhere to go. They stay here and we get to enjoy them for years to come. Anything that humans can do to work towards coral conservation is a good thing. We're just trying to identify some of the best steps we can take to help other people do that restoration work as successfully as possible.